I'm glad you're sitting next to me, Jean, because I want to start with you. Okay. Why doesn't narcissism make us happy? Well, uh, it is a question of what happens in the short term versus what happens in the long term. Because in the short term, someone who's high on narcissism, yeah, they're happy, they feel positive emotions. Um, it feels great to feel good about yourself. What happens in the long term is more problematic. So first, because they take too many risks and don't have a good sense of their own abilities, um, they tend, in the long run, to be less successful than other people. So uh, generally, um, they don't do as well at work. The even bigger problem is that, especially in the long term, relationships tend to fall apart uh, for people who are high in narcissism. So they want to have relationships, um, and they go reasonably well at first. They're exciting, they're extroverted, they're confident. But then, because they don't actually care about the other person, that relationship tends to fall apart. So they're great in the u butte stage, when you've just met one another and you're full of hormones and excitement. Yes. But then the changing the baby's nappy stage, they're not as good at that. That's right, because that's beneath them. Um, and in general, it's very hard to keep a relationship going when one person thinks it's all about them and doesn't truly care about the, about the other. It's, it's different from materialism, but it's a bit like materialism, isn't it? Because materialism is about stuff, and we think, we think stuff will make us happy, but stuff turns out not to make us happy. That's right. Yeah, so people who are high in narcissism uh, tend to be more materialistic. It's, it's one of the, the correlations. So there's definitely some overlap there. So materialism is also captured by uh, what some people say, Tim Kasser, who studies materialism, um, calls um, uh, ec extrinsic values. So things like money, fame, and image. Hmm. And that's exactly what uh, narcissists care about. And the problem is, in the long run, even really in the short term, that's not a great recipe for mental health. Uh, the self and stuff is not uh, a good basis for mental health. You really need good relationships and meaning in life to have that. I know that's theoretically true. <laughs> <laughs> Part of me does wonder if a house on the harbour and, <laughs> and a Jaguar XJ, if anyone's listening, might help. I do, I have to say. Hugh, what you've just been talking about is pretty much, and I know it's the subject of the book, pretty much the opposite of narcissism. It's treating others mm. as you'd like them to treat you. Mm. Does, doesn't that make us feel virtuous rather than happy? Uh, yes, it might make us feel virtuous or it might make us feel impatient, frustrated, even angry with the people who are demanding our help. That's good. Uh, that means I've been doing it right. <laughs> uh, none of those things are relevant if you're interested in the idea of goodness. I mean, goodness is a moral concept. If you're going to enshrine goodness as the centre of your life, if you're going to say, I actually want to lead a good life, then the question of how you're feeling... Um, I mean, it's why I have a problem with the name of the conference. If you, it depends how you define happiness. But if, if you're interested in how you're feeling, you've missed the whole point. Our, our role, I'd almost go so far as to say our duty as social creatures, as people who rely on each other. I mean, we are sustained by communities. Look how we live. Cities, suburbs, towns, villages. There are isolates, there are hermits. But broadly speaking, we prefer to congregate. Um, we we, we cohabit. Uh, and, and these communities that sustain us don't just happen, and they don't necessarily survive. They themselves have to be nurtured. And so if you're going to talk about our most fundamental duty as the social creatures we are, it is to nurture those communities. Now, that's all about responding to people's needs. It's all about being more cooperative than competitive. Uh, etc. But if you do that, if you are a good person, you'll find it gives you something nourishing. You may and you may not. Um, I, Hang and, on, and you've got to sell it better than this, Hugh. No. <laughs> <laughs> this, I think, is one of, the, one of the problems about the whole concept, that, that it's so tempting to say, and if you live like this, you'll feel like an angel. You know, you'll be a saint. Well, I, I was talking about this to a group of people recently and uh, someone in the audience said, look, a friend of mine says he's got a cure for the blues. 
whenever he's feeling a bit down, he just goes out and finds someone who needs help and helps them and he feels better. Now, half of me thought, yeah, well, that's probably good. Those people got help. Half of me thought, this is appalling. This is stripping all the virtue out of it. I mean, this is like exploiting. There's a frail elderly person yes. wanting to cross the road. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go and help her across the road because I'll feel better. I mean, the motive is just so off. So missing the point of what Especially virtue she's is about. Not wanting to go across the road. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a, a, a blind lady say exactly that, Richard. That uh, she lives lives in Albury, saying she's been assisted across several streets she never intended to cross. <laughs> Roy, I want to I want to bring if you I in. Could add Something to this, I mean, what, what he's brought up is one of the most profound uh, debates that's gone on in philosophy and psychology and others for, for, uh, for hundreds of years is, are people really good? Is there such a thing as altruism? Or are they really just being selfish and just doing things to make themselves feel better? And my thing is, maybe this is phrasing the question the wrong way. We should be happy that our species evolved so that we can take satisfaction and mm. pleasure out of helping others. Mm. Because mm. The, cooperating with people other animals cooperate with their relatives, but to cooperate with people we're not related to is extremely unusual in nature, mm -hmm. uh, and yet it happens all the time in our species. So that's, uh, nature's given us a great gift, and it's one of the foundations of human nature. And we don't have to say, well, it's really selfish, or uh, somebody satirized Kant's thing on it and say, somebody asking me for a favor, but I think I would take pleasure in giving you a favor, so I can't do it. It would be morally <laughs> wrong. You know, uh, I'm sorry. If I get to I don't like you, and so I don't want to help you, then I can help you. Um, <laughs> Yes. I, I can, it, it's, just, it's just visible in my memory, but I can remember as a young person acting in a way that could be construed as altruistic in order to impress somebody else. Well, yes, there's that too. Uh, it didn't work, as I recall. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about something else because some of the stuff we've been talking about and, and this idea that it's all about me and whether it makes you happy, that approach, it, it's gained obviously a lot of traction all about me in people. It, does that happen because the bling, the attention, all of that, they are uh, proxies or markers for high status? Oh, that question didn't go where I thought it was going. That's all right. <laughs> Say that again. What I'm saying is, I don't know, so expensive holidays, lots of bling, yes. I'm worth it. What does this have to do with helping others? 300,000, no, we've moved on. Okay. 300... <laughs> okay. All right, so... $300,000 limousines named after big cats. They're all proxies for high status. Do you have an obsession with... No, I do not. Richard? <laughs> <laughs> They're all proxies for high status. And, I'm, and status is something that's kind of... It's, it's burned into our wiring, in a way. Uh, yes, in, in nature, uh, lots of the primates and other mammals have status hierarchies, males more than females. But, uh, yes, uh, you see... In nature, the, uh, the male who fought himself to the top of the group got to have sex with all the females and the others didn't. So we're descended from the ones who wanted to and tried and succeeded at uh, fighting their way to the top. So yes, we have some of that too. And, and that's, that's natural. That's found all over the world. And it's not one of the most lovely parts of human nature. But no, it's not, and it's, it's a double-edged sword, there. isn't it? Yes, but it, again, it's useful to society. Ambition uh, motivates people to work longer than they absolutely need to uh, keep food on the table. Having I said this, sorry, I just, can I just add yeah, one yeah. little quick comment to that? I think this is an important point that we're not talking about some absurdly idealistic view. We are competitive as well as cooperative. We are yeah. self-interested as well as altruistic. Uh, it's just that unless we're leashing the stuff that's rampant in us, uh, the other stuff might just wither away. Charity begins at home. It's one of my favourite proverbs that's been massively misinterpreted through the 20th century. It has nothing at all to do with looking after yourself and your own. It has to do with early childhood intervention. The charity begins, the nurturing of our charitable impulse needs to begin in the home with children while they are young or they may never learn to leash the other stuff. I'm interested in tying this back to the narcissism that I started by asking you about. Because surely the, the social context that Hugh has just been talking about, and Roy, is, is vital in this. It's not enough to think that you're brilliant, that you're better than other people, the whole thing. 
if you live as a recluse and never see anybody else, it's got to be you and the majesty of you against humanity, doesn't it? Well, yes, because one of the uh, key parts of narcissism is attention-seeking. So, yeah, it's not just someone saying, I'm awesome, it's, I am awesome, look at me right now, and, and appreciate that. They need that attention from others, and that, it doesn't come from insecurity. It comes from uh, wanting this status and wanting this recognition of the status. But I think the difference is from, say, the, the primates is uh, with, the, with the primates, that one who fought to the top really fought to the top, he really won the fight. It's not just that he said, hey, I won the fight, um, even if he didn't actually win the fight. He didn't get a trophy just for showing up. No. <laughs> I was thinking, the double-edged sword with, with the status thing is it's great to have the high status, but the constant working and hustling and showing off to maintain the high status, that could bring on a bit of worry and anxiety. Perhaps, and that I think is, so, is one of the reasons why in the long term, narcissists do end up depressed and anxious uh, is because they've done all that hustling and then in the end they're still not happy. Actually, um, Roy, both you and Hugh talk about having a, I'm going to paraphrase you a bit, but having a meaningful life rather than a necessarily a happy life. What's a meaningful life? Um, do you want uh, an example, or you want a I do. definition? <laughs> I'm a journalist. <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, differentiating happiness and meaning, um, if you want to look at, at separate ones, so if we look for a highly meaningful life that would not be happy, uh, I would think you know, someone like a terrorist, a revolutionary, possibly a missionary, uh, you know, someone who puts up with a lot of suffering and misfortune, works hard, doesn't get a lot of pleasures and joys, but in service of a cause that uh, he or she really believes in. You know, and again, the uh, terrorist, revolutionary, missionary, uh, the, the, not that those are similar in other respects, but uh, they're all working for grand causes that they fervently believe in. Uh, and, you know, their day-to-day -day life uh, might not be very, very happy or satisfying, and you know, many of them end quite miserably. But you, you're an advocate for having a meaningful life. I don't know that I'm an advocate. advocate? I, uh, I don't try to tell people how to live. I, uh, when I say that, I don't mean always saying that people should be terrorists or missionaries. I'm saying, when you ex explain it, in, certainly in the, in the book, it, it does sound like it's something bigger and more coherent than having a happy life. Because a happy life is a, really a sort of series of happy presents, if I could put it that way. Happiness is an in-the-present thing meaningfulness is something that has a past and a present and a future. There's a story. Yes, uh, some of our recent work is looking at the, how experience is spread out in time and uh, um, happiness is really maximized, is really focused on the present. Uh, the more people think about the present and the less they think about the past and the future, the happier they are. Uh, with meaning, it tends to go the other way, that meaning is uh, linked into the past and future and especially how they are tied together. Meaning's about connection. It's a, it's a non-physical kind of connection among things. And things draw meaning from contexts which are broader than they are. So for a life to have meaning, you have to find something bigger than the life uh, to have meaning for. That's another issue, I think, uh, implicit in what Jean was saying about how narcissists aren't really going to be happy. Well, uh, the self as a source of meaning likewise breaks down um, because when the self dies, then if that's what the meaning, the purpose of your life was, to glorify the self, well, then it's gone. Uh, so if you devote your life, you know, the things I mentioned, the political and the, the religious things, things that you know, religious, you've got eternity on your side, and politics, you've at least got you know, future generations or two. So you're really uh, putting your life in the context of something bigger and grander and broader than your, your life. The, the if we pull that into the domestic context, um, I'm a parent, I have a 14-year-old, I have a nearly 11-year-old. My children do not always make me happy. <laughs> they often make me quite unhappy. I was telling you earlier about a particular incident with my son. However, it is a meaningful thing to be their dad. There's no question, and the data are supporting that too, uh, that uh, parenthood is a terrific source of meaning. Uh, as a source of happiness, it's uh, more dubious. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yes. People started there's, finding there's new data on that too, 50s. and new analyses. So Sonia Lubomorski's looked at that and um, basically concluded that you know 
the idea that parents are unhappy all of the time seems to have been somewhat overblown, that it depends a little bit on what type of parent you are. If you're I a single parent, that's really tough. I saw this data, and again, she's going up against about 40 other studies uh, over things, but it is possible, and I, I think of you are going to see it, that it's because parenthood has changed that uh, yes. parents a generation ago thought they needed to do the right thing for society, and it was a duty, so that would have lowered happiness, uh, which has gotten meaning. Now parents look at children who they're supposed to make the parent fulfilled. Uh, and so they may parent in a way that really won't be as good for the kid in the long run, but it'll make mm -hmm. the parent happier. Mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe the yeah. negative impact on happiness is possibly mitigated by the more narcissistic parenting style. Uh, it's possible. I, I knew I was doing something wrong. Um, that offers me something, I, not, not necessarily anything good. <laughs> there, is, uh, there is some research suggesting, I think it's Daniel Gilbert at, at Harvard, uh, saying he found that parent, parents described themselves as being at their happiest when they were not with their kids. Uh, when, yes. when they were out having dinner together or at a movie or playing golf. But, to come back to the conversation you and Roy have just been having, but they felt that the richest source of meaning in their lives was related to their parenting. And if you're not a parent, you can get the same idea from work. I mean, there are people, presumably, uh, you may know some, I don't, but there presumably are some people who skip to work on Monday morning, whistling merry tunes about the joys of the workplace and their cup overflowing with happiness at the prospect of their colleagues. Uh, this is not most people. No. Uh, most people don't think about work as a source of happiness, but almost everyone in paid or unpaid work thinks of that as a source of meaningfulness in their lives. Well, I work at the ABC, so... <laughs> <laughs> so it's both. <laughs> Jean, I know you are very concerned, very concerned about young people with the it's all about me thing. Is there a way of reframing what they want, and they want it a lot, um, so that it's more about meaning than happiness? So what, what is your perception of what young people today want? Let's start there. Well, they want to be famous. Yes. Uh, they want a lot of bling. They, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm generalising wildly, of course, because there's going to be lot, lots of people not like this. And they want uh, a lot of attention and money. Okay. Well... And they want it now. Right. The, the good news is... Um, the young generation, so I call them Generation Me, they're in the States, they're often called the Millennials, um, they want some of the same things that generations have always wanted. They want to get married and have a family, um, they want to have a good job, um, but you're right, the, these values of money, fame, and image have also increased in importance, especially materialism um, has really uh, hit an all-time high in uh, a lot of these surveys. So, um, your question was... <laughs> can we? Can this be reframed? Because because you you've basically been talking about how this stuff doesn't make you happy. It's a short road to happiness, but not right. a long road. Right. Is there a way of reframing it so that people, young people especially, engage with the idea of meaning rather than happiness? Mm -hmm. um, perhaps it is difficult because I think there is an assumption um, among this generation that those things, money, fame, and image, is going to make them happy and is going to provide meaning. Uh, so I think we have to get the message out, as we're doing here, that these things are not actually the best road to happiness, that there are other more productive ways to be happy and have meaning in life. It's, that's easier to get your head around when you're older than 30 than it is when you're younger than 18, isn't it? It may be, but, you know, the baby boomers, so I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, so in theory I should really not like the, the baby boomers. But when you really look at what they said when they were young, they talked about how much, I mean, they, in surveys, they said developing a meaningful philosophy of life was important. They said exploring meaning and purpose in life was important. And you know what's happened to the, that, those responses in surveys? Straight down for Gen X and, and the millennials. So we can maybe take a page out of their book that when they were 18 and 20, they were placing an importance on these things. And maybe it might be better if we got back there again. Hugh. It is also, just as a footnote to what Jean is saying, worth reminding ourselves that the term me generation was actually coined for the baby boomers. I mean, we've now acutely talked about generation me, but it was the parents of, uh, or a bit older, 
of Generation Me. Yeah, that, their kids took generation. it to the took it to the next level. To the next level, yes. started it, <laughs> but they kept it going. Yeah, that's true. I'm yeah. wondering. If I think you're being a bit rough on the rising generation, by the way, Richard. I mean, I think uh, as a <laughs> for the purposes of this discussion. <laughs> but I, you know, my I see and signs are fantastic. Of, I see signs of uh, a more cooperative, communitarian spirit in the under 30s than was true of their parents. I'm sorry, yeah, okay. So we looked at this, and this isn't US data, but we looked at this really carefully a few years ago because I thought that was possible. I thought there, it was a possibility that you could get maybe more of the self-focus, more of the narcissism, as well as more civic engagement, more concern for others, either they're two populations or maybe they're finding um, attention through helping others. Not you know, so much again. civic engagement, but tribalism. Okay, yes. um, or just community feeling, and um, we got the best data we could from university students and twelfth uh, graders. Um, data that goes back to the 1960s and 70s, so looking at people of the same age, but at these different points in time, different generations. And um, those born in the 80s and 90s were less interested in civic engagement in politics, less concerned for others, and so on. Quite to my disappointment, I had hoped we could have maybe both going on, but that's, that's not what they said about themselves in the surveys. But I'm wondering, Roy, if it's harder for them to be that way now, um, because they're, they are exposed to a lot more branding and it's easier to kind of, when you're looking for what your identity is, to embrace those brands. They're sort of proxies for you. So brands and celebrities. And the traditional media gives them this message and social media backs it up. Uh, I always thought the idea of drawing meaning in your life from brands, that just always struck me as bizarre. Uh, but I guess people do people it. They're do, proud. Yeah. I mean, it seemed to me you don't want to use your body as, an, as a billboard to advertise things, uh, you know, printing the names of all the products that you're wearing in big letters on there. But, uh, uh, you know, it seems like the company should pay me to wear a T-shirt that has their name on it. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I guess a lot of people feel different. So uh, I, I hope, hope to understand that someday. I suppose that's what I'm wondering. Is, it's harder now. I think the amount of branding thrown at young people is much more than it was when I was a young person. And it's easier to think that the way to be happy is to have the right T-shirt than it was when I was a kid. Just, you mentioned social media, uh, and there are lots of things to be said about Facebook, etc., as platforms for bragging and encouragement to narcissism, etc. Also, though, an encouragement to connection, uh, to being mm. constantly in touch with what the members of the tribe are up to. And so it's not all... That, that's, that's a curious blend of selfish and selfless, I think. Are you optimistic about all this, <laughs> Jean? Um, to an extent, I think that this, the, the growing individualism is a, is, a, is a mixed bag. I mean, any cultural system has good things and bad things about it. Um, I am very optimistic um, about the culture and about uh, this young generation in terms of equality, say based on race and gender and background and sexual orientation. The changes in that area have been fast and wonderful and will probably continue. And so that's where I think we can draw a lot of optimism. Um, I am not quite as optimistic about some of the rest of it simply because I think this culture has not prepared young people for reality, that they've been told all their lives that they're special, uh, and then they reach the workforce and find out that that may not be the case, that they may not be treated that way. And that's not their fault. That's how what their parents told them and what they saw when they uh, were watching television. And I, a lot of young people are angry, and I think rightly so. What about you? <laughs> There's an angry one. <laughs> <laughs> but good, at least you're doing something. That's, that's what about you, Roy? What do you, how do you feel about this? Because I'm thinking about the, the book you wrote about willpower. Willpower is a hard thing to teach people to have um, because it, it seems easier to just eat the cookie, basically. Um, are you, how, do you, how do you feel about... In terms the, of the this, optimism question... You know, if we look back in time, there have been lots of doomsayers and lots of optimists. And in general, the optimists have won. Life has uh, continued to get, I mean, there, there's always change. Change brings winners and losers. Uh, some changes are for the better and some for the worse. But the positive changes have largely outnumbered the negative ones. Life is certainly better now uh, than it was 100 years ago. And, uh, 
even if you go to things uh, like Cornelius Vanderbilt was the richest man in America, but he didn't have indoor plumbing, uh, he didn't have antibiotics, he didn't have television, radio, telephone. So uh, even the very moderate income people today have lots of wonderful things that he didn't. So I think just on that basis, uh, it's a great time to be alive and uh, uh, more things will get better than worse. Mm. I'm wondering if there's something in the idea of becoming accidentally happy. <laughs> <laughs> Not aiming for it, but just sort of ending up there anyway. You, there's something in that, isn't there? I mean, I, I know from my own um, realisations that I'm happy, it, it, it strikes me at times when I wouldn't expect it to. It's not when um, I'm at the football or mm. I'm at a concert. It's when I'm cooking a meal for the family or something like that. Mm. Fleeting visits. That's, that's, what, that's what we get. Uh, and sometimes we didn't realise we had the visit until it's gone. Um, but, but, yeah, that's right. It, it, is, it is accidental, which is why I'm urging people not to enshrine it as, as the goal of their pursuit. Uh, let, let it happen. And, and we all know that it's much more likely to happen when we are leading a good life, but that's not part of the promise. We're back to where we started. And that's a good place to wrap things up, I think. <laughs>